21 Fall Speaker Series for the Equine Industry Program, sponsored by our friends at Horse Racing Nation. We couldn't do this without them. Appreciate you guys coming tonight and joining us on live. We've got a really interesting panel for you tonight, but before we get to that, I want to remind you we do have two more um, sessions coming up. October 12th, we'll look at how racing can grow through diversity and inclusion. And then you'll want to be with us on November 9th when Mattress Mac will be here. And that's going to be an entertaining evening. Jim Mac and Vale, who, if you don't know, owns Run Happy and Gallery Furniture down in Houston. He's a huge humanitarian. He's very outspoken. I think you'll really enjoy him. Those two panels are going to be held over in the Student Activities Center. And we'll have more on that on our Facebook page. So, you make a good day better. That's a quote from a former boss of mine, David Yutt, at Evangeline Downs. And back in 2004, it was the impetus behind something that we created called Louisiana Legends Day. It was the evening of stakes races uh, for state bred horses, and we honored all the legends in our sport in Louisiana at the time. And this could have been one of racing's first supercards back in the day, although I'm sure there were many others. Of course, we immediately think of the Triple Crown races, the Belmont, the Derby, the Preakness, and of course the Breeders' Cup. Today it goes far beyond those marquee events. It seems that nearly every racetrack has taken a big racing day and tried to make it better, and putting their best races together on one card. Of course, there are other aspects of this including special events and promotions if you're live on track. Maybe discounted takeout rates for those players through ADWs for pick threes, pick fours, pick fives, and even pick sixes. And then there's special broadcasts, maybe on Fox Sports or on TVG, focusing on that big night of racing or that big afternoon of racing. Those are just a few examples. Tonight we've assembled a panel to look at this trend and we call it examining horse racing supercard trend. We put together an outstanding panel. We'll introduce them to you in a moment. First, I want to introduce our moderator. Many, many of you know him. It's Mark Midland from Horse Racing Nation. He co-sponsors our event. He's been in the business for over 25 years in marketing and management experience. He's held executive positions at Churchill Downs, Harris, you bet, before launching Horse Racing Startup, Horse Racing Labs, LLC back in 2009. He has a track record of innovating new products, including the Kentucky Derby Future Wager back in 1999, and the 20-horse wagering field we see at, at Churchill Downs on Derby Day in the Kentucky Derby back in 2001. With Horse Racing Labs, Mark launched Horse Racing Nation, Derby Wars, and he was a co-founder and board member of Timeform US. Horse Racing Nation has grown to one of the top news sites in horse racing, and if you don't go there every day to read the news, you should. I'm going to turn it over to Mark and our panel this evening. Let's give them a little warm welcome. Thanks, Sean. Uh, excited to be here for tonight's panel and want to introduce uh, the panel. And uh, to my left is John Moss. Uh, John served as the uh, Iowa Horsemen's Benevolent and Protective Association's Executive Director since 2011. He's a fourth generation horseman. His family has been a fixture on Nebraska and Midwest racing, racing circuits since the late 1920s, so approaching 100 years, very impressive. Uh, until recently, his father retired from race training in 2014. John graduated from the racetrack industry program at the University of Arizona in 2006. The opposition. The opposition, yeah. And he previously worked for the Pennsylvania HBPA as their associate executive director. Uh, in his position for the Iowa HBPA, he represents <coughs> thoroughbred horsemen's concerns and wishes when working with Prairie Meadows, the Iowa and Racing, Racing and Gaming Commission, and various horse racing associations and governmental agencies. Uh, next, we have uh, Ben Huffman, who has been the uh, Racing Secretary at Keeneland since 2002 and at Churchill Downs since 2006. Uh, Ben's a native of Louisville, Kentucky. I uh, grew up down the street from Churchill Downs. Uh, began working for his father, the late trainer William G. Blackie Huffman, as a teenager. Uh, he attended Western Kentucky University and the University of Louisville. Uh, and his first job in the racing office was at Ellis Park in 1990, working as a claims clerk. So, come a long way since then. Long time ago. Uh, Ben's worked, I think it seems like every track in the industry is a assistant racing secretary or racing <laughs> secretary, uh, Saratoga, Keeneland, Ellis, Turfway, Fairgrounds. 
Uh, he was uh, the race secretary and director of racing at the fairgrounds, and uh, most recently promoted to uh, VP of racing and race secretary uh, at Churchill Downs in 2019. Uh, he's a member of the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association of American Graded Stakes Committee and the North American Ratings Committee, and uh, resides in Crestwood, Kentucky, with his wife, Chris. And last but not least, Eric Hallstrom, uh, the Vice President and General Manager of Racing at Indiana Grand in Shelbyville, uh, graduate also of the University of Arizona Racetrack Industry Program, uh, spent numerous years, been attested to in the general GM capacity at uh, various racetracks, including Canterbury Park, Fairgrounds, and Two Caesars Entertainment Tracks, Louisiana Downs, and now Indiana Grand. And uh, among the things that uh, take, took place under Eric's direction were making the Louisiana Derby a $1 million race, setting handle records for stake stays and subtle tracks, and instituting family-friendly entertainment events uh, to attract large-scale crowds. And this is cool. Just this year, Eric put in place the first row with a mission to capture critical video for use by the stewards and horse players. Mm -hmm. Eric is married and uh, has three children, all of whom share his love of horse racing, so he's building new fans for the future, which is great. So, uh, very excited uh, for tonight's panel, and uh, I was thrilled that Sean asked me to moderate. Uh, for me, uh, I spent the first 15 years of my career in horse racing, sort of uh, in management and front side marketing, and uh, working with the, the racing office in, in, on big stakes days and things like that. And uh, one of the things I love about this topic is it's so interdisciplinary. So we're talking about uh, U of L and Mind program and the students. Uh, we're talking about you know big days. We're talking about moving around stake stays. We're talking about the purse accounts. We're talking about the fans. We're talking about on track fans. We're talking about off track simulcasting uh, players on their ADWs. We're talking about uh, the purse account, the horsemen, and, and the ripple effects. Uh, we're talking about marketing, branding. We're talking about uh, you know accounting and, and the numbers and, and all those things. So and we're talking about the future. So I think it's a great great topic. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is, you know, in today's world of the explosion of sports wagering, it, I think it's more important than ever, we all realize, to promote horse racing as much as possible. And I think part of that is these big days, and part of it is innovation, which is essentially what these big days are. And I think, you know, innovation has not been racing strongest suit over the years, but I give credit all to the tracks, especially the last couple of years, and, and perhaps through the pandemic, experimenting even more with big days, different days, different racing nights, uh, different cars, bringing new fans, catering to players. And I think it's a wonderful trend, and I think it's, it's a great to innovate and take new shots at things, and, and you're not gonna be right every time, but that's okay, uh, you know, we're in the entertainment industry, and uh, you know, uh, when I worked at Harris, uh, Gary Lovin used to say, we could all be selling insurance, but this is the gambling entertainment industry, let's have fun, let's treat it as such. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention uh, an old boss of mine, Alan Gutterman, who is a marketing executive at many tracks, was actually the original creator of the big Super Saturday Stakes Days. And uh, I just talked to him today. Uh, he was saying back in the early 90s at Naira, uh, he was vice president of marketing. And uh, the Breeders' Cup, of course, started in 84. So it kind of changed the fall stakes schedule. And a lot of the Belmont stakes used to be the championship races, and when you know realizing that they weren't anymore, uh, it made sense that Breeders Cup preps to package them uh, for television to pack them into Super Saturdays and Breeders Cup preview days and, and put them on television. And so that created uh, uh, some of the first uh, Super Stakes days. So, um, so all right, so let's dive in. Um, First, before we get into the heart of it, just kind of want to go through the numbers of each of your different tracks. Um, and Eric, I'll start with you with the Indiana Derby. You know, like, what are the numbers? What are we talking about when we talk about creating a big day or days? How many stakes? How much in purse money? Um, do, do we see a bump in attendance? Do we see bumps in handle? You know, those sorts of things. Sure. No, and the first time, I'd like to thank Sean for having me here. The, I feel very, very honored to be with this group, especially you know, I have three friends I'm up here with, so this is a great day. Um, <clears throat> I actually think Indiana Grand's a, a very uh, good case in point for a racetrack who has put together big days and then through an act of God or a pandemic has had to move and adapt to what, you know, what is faced in front of them. So it's only my second year in Indiana Grand. Um, 
2019, the late John Schuster held a Saturday night Indiana Grand, uh, big big stakes night. Uh, the Derby, the Oaks, the several other stakes, and totaled up about 800,000 in purses. And at one point, I think it was even higher. The Indiana Derby used to be 500,000, but you know, the 2019, they, they set a handle record of a little over four million dollars, which is a great day for. Um, the track in Cornfield in Indiana. You know, it's really, really the fact that the next day I got a hold of him to congratulate him. We were, we worked for the same company and John was a friend of mine. Um, and he was, he was giddy, you know, 4.1 or whatever that was was something very important to them and they were celebrating. And, you know, my, John very unfortunately passed in the December of 2019. Um, I started at, at Indiana Grand in February. Three weeks later, they sent us all home, and you know, with a lot of a lot of doubt, and not understanding of what might be next. And then remember, this was also during that time where Foner was doing eight million dollars a day, and Will Rogers was you know going to have was setting records, and tracks were coming up one by one. And we were one of the, the earlier ones, but. It became pretty clear at that point that the trying to build a house was not going to be a thing. You know, uh, our, our derby is in early July, and at that point, you know, sometime in March and April, there were protocols, capacity restrictions. Ben can tell you all about it. He knows just as well. John, we've all seen it. And it turned into a thing where we made a decision pretty early not to have people come and track, which was, goes against every fiber of you know what I've tried to do in my life. And we put it on a Wednesday and kind of looked, you know, Keeneland picked up that week uh, you know, in the 2020 year. We thought maybe we could you know, stay between your races and catch some of you know the, the your draft behind you there. And you know, it turned out you know, this will never happen again, but we had the Kentucky Oaks winner when our our Indiana Oaks, she bears a bell. And, you know, let's, let's hope that that never comes a case again because that means the world's gone wrong again. But the quality was great. We had several horsemen in during the middle of the week who probably wouldn't be there on the weekend, other commitments, several jockeys that could say the same thing. And our handle was $6 million. And so, you know, we. We celebrate. It's a it's a big win for that little racetrack. That you know we're not Ben. We Ben's place. We're we're gonna have to try to do what we can do and know who we are. Going into 2021, we had the same issue though, because nothing was simple over the winter. If you remember, there was peaks and valleys and COVID protocols and whatnot. And we just made the long term decision for 2021 to do the same thing and see what we can do and see where the ceiling is on a Wednesday. And you know, we had another great, great derby day and you know, six and a half million dollar handle that day. So there is going to come a point, and we're, I'm not sure what we're going to do next year. You know, let's, let's hope that things are normal and you can fill the building and you can sell tickets and you can pack the apron. Um, and if that's the case, I'm not sure which, which direction we go, but it does get harder when you see um, six and a half million dollar handle come in and you're being extremely efficient in your building you know there's we don't have enough employees to work we, you know, we have plenty of issues where um, in this year it's not just revenue but your your efficiency is off the charts so we got a little bit of time to figure it out and i'm not sure what, what we do it's it's really interesting example of, of, of you know creation of innovating with the pandemic and Ben used to do an example of that at Churchill Downs where you were able to create a new stakes day uh, that sort of came out of the pandemic. Why don't you tell us about that? Sure. We, we've talked about for years, actually. We always have Derby Week. That's that's a huge week uh, going way back. Tremendous stakes program, Derby Week. And we've always, and we've always had Steve Foster Day. For years, they've been highly successful. Uh, all those cars, and we've talked about we, we need a third big day somewhere in the middle of it with where the Stephen Foster sat the one week after the Belmont every year with a, with a 38 day spring meet. There was really no room to add another big day, so we, we just kept talking about it. And 
reluctantly, we said, okay, let's just move Stephen Foster Day to the end of the meet, and then we'll be able to do a, create a Stephen Foster preview day, if you will, in the middle, in the middle from Oaks and Derby Day to the end of the meet. And we, we did it last year during the, pan, the pandemic, and that card, last year and this year on preview day in the middle of the meet, turned out, I think, both years and handled over $14 million. And then Steve Foster Day at the end, uh, I think both years was just under $17 million. So in handle. So both days were tremendously successful, but it, it was weird how long it took us to come up with that, that third big day for the spring meet. But two years in, it, it, with a pandemic, it, it, it seems to work really, really well. It, it, that's great, and it's, it's tough to break with tra tra tradition. You know what works, and, it, and you go into the unknown, not knowing what uh, doesn't work, uh, or if it hasn't been tested yet. But John, in Iowa, you've got the Cornhusker and the Stakes Festival every year. That's been around for a long time. Of course, players know it, fans know it. Um, where does that sit with the track and the horsemen in, in terms of uh, it's been around a long time? So it's just is it something that you talk about a lot, or is it something that's just well, we're stamped every year. So for us, it's it's uh, it always comes up. There's always topics of discussion in relation to you know kind of the whole concept of a big race day and the whole uh, aspect of stakes races in and of themselves versus the overnight program. These gentlemen put it on, trying to put on big cards for you know the, the, for everybody, including ourselves and horsemen in general. You know we got to have stake races. That's what. The cream of the crop, that's what everybody wants to watch, and you know, that's what the competition is about. So, we'll be back with the best, but we also want to, you know, kind of fixate on making sure that the every day average horsemen and individuals that are going to be able to major on the product get taken care of by the overnights. So, we always look at that balance it's a balance of the first money that's set aside specifically for state races versus the first money that's set aside specifically for the overnight program. Your claiming races, your allowance races. Sometimes you might have an overnight stake, start races, things of those sorts. So in our particular example or situation, we kind of allocate how much money we want to go to that. This last year was about 1.7, 1.8 million. Uh, and reserved just about 10.3 million for the overnight program. Uh, and it sounds like a, a you know not that much, but it's a pretty significant amount. We start looking at some of the individual races, it's like the four months or handicap is a three hundred thousand dollar race. And for ourselves, it's a pretty significant outlay, but it equ equates to almost two days worth of overnight races. So we're constantly looking at that balance of, you know, by having this, you know, the stakes program in and of itself, and then concentrating all these races on a particular couple of days. We also have the Iowa Classic night. It's a little bit different in so much as, you know, I think you were talking about the Louisiana breads and those sort of things. We also do Iowa Classic night for our Iowa bread. So that's another significant outlay of cash. But there's a little bit of support for that from our breeders program. So some of the money comes back in. But the stakes program, you know, specifically with festival just comes right out of the overnights and there's no extra cash or something like that in. So we're looking at is this a conflict? What, what exactly are we trying to accomplish? And are we able to bring in additional horses, not only to race in those particular races, but you know, by concentrating those races, sometimes we're hoping that, you know, a trainer will bring in like a, a Brad Cox or Todd Fletcher or Steve Asmussen. But not just have a column. If we have all these races spread out, we might not ship a whole bunch of horses at one time. But if we line these all up so that there's a couple of days here, then I have a couple of opportunity to bring in more horses for ourselves. We're, you know, we're sitting here at church or wherever else it might be, but we're not sitting at my particular racetrack. And I think, especially for us kind of middle tier tracks and whatnot, we're always kind of trying to figure out when he's placing Stephen Foster. Okay, well, we can't go after those horses on that day. I've got to work around it. And that's what we're constantly trying to do is, you know, two things. One, we're going to be able to accomplish bringing in more horses, bringing in more horses for those other cars. We're also going to be able to avoid some of those other big state races. It, that's kind of why the best old racing is where it is, is to try and avoid some of the other big races that are going on at that time. I think I could say it's, it was somewhat successful this year. We had Nick's go kind of ride, we slightly won by a pole. But nonetheless, it was still a good race. We had a lot of people turn out and people were very interested. Uh, and I give Prairie Meadows a lot of credit. They, uh, they've been working really hard on the wagering for Pony Road as well, by bringing in the uh, jackpot pick five. And they had a uh, mandatory payout on Monday. Our festival was over Friday, Saturday, but they made the mandatory payment 
on Monday. So they were able to bring some of those wagers along for a couple more days. And on that Monday, it was darn near $3 million, which for them, that's a, that for us, that's a big amount of money. Uh, we were quite pleased with that. Uh, and I think they did have a pretty good combination there as well. Uh, but it, it, again, that's that's kind of you know just a quick dirty of what it is that we're looking at is is this state race and does this program work? And I will tell you, uh, not to be and draw too much farther, but there is a continuous there's different polls. Uh, you know, and these gentlemen probably heard it too, because I'll have folks from come to me and say, you know, we can really use that money elsewhere. Like I said, when you have one state <coughs> race, that's the equivalent of two days of overnight races. So one race is taking up the equivalency of almost 16 other races. That's a pretty significant hit to the rest of the individuals who are there running continuously supporting the program and making that, you know, that bread and butter of what the racing product actually is. Because, you know, don't forget, 66 to 7% of the races are, in fact, claiming races. That's what makes this industry go around in a circle. Stakes are fun and great, but they're not actually what necessarily drives the underpinnings of keeping the sources racing and going and, and have, providing that overall support mechanism for it. Uh, all the rest of the cash that we accrue in the industry and all. Yeah, it's interesting. There's definitely a lot of pluses and minuses. The money has to come from somewhere. Uh, you mentioned the horse players. You know, I know for myself and friends, uh, you know, I may not play Prairie Meadows uh, regularly, but it's nice when there's stakes. I get to play it again and go, okay, I remember what I'm looking for here. Kind of get in, in the habit of it again. And I think that sometimes it can create a positive effect that lasts longer than that weekend. And, Beyond. They call it they call it stickiness. If I remember right. right, that's a mark. I'm not I'm horse, but not market. Right, that. Yeah. Stickiness. Yeah. stickiness. There's a branding component, right? And branding is sort of a fluffy marketing component of like we're gonna promote our brand, and you can't really measure it. Um, but you know, when you're creating fans or create familiarity with your product that can last over time, there's some benefits there. Um, so, so we're talking about Eric. You know, the what's the goal? What are we trying to help accomplish with these big days? And what are some of the pluses and minuses? I mean, for you, Indiana Grand, what is the goal of ever? You know, it's a good. It's a good question. I think, you know, going back to what I said, I think you got to know who you are, where you're starting off, and you know, as as we sit here with this panel, you know. Ben is as down to earth as any of us. He just happens to have the biggest race in the world. <laughs> and the best horses in the country sitting in his barn area. Um, that's not us. And you know, we have a 120 day meet, which is a, a long, it's a long meet that, you know, we support a lot of a lot of people in Indiana. You know, the that breeding program is hanging on very well. As John mentioned, I, I'm also a true believer in that you can't forget those, you know, the locals and others who are filling those cars on Monday, Tuesday, and you're off the, the non-highlight days. That being said, we do have goals in Indiana Grand to go up another level. And whatever that is, I, we, you can call it A, B, C, D, well, I don't know what we are, but we want to go from where we are to something plus. And I do think, you know, we're, you know, it's crazy. We're right now sitting in the greatest spot for thoroughbred horse racing in, in the world. You know, we, we, more horses bred in this area, and the racing is the best between here and Lexington. And we're an hour and a half away, and you wouldn't know that we we're on the same planet. <laughs> and but the, they will travel, and you know if the the race is fit and whatnot. And I, I think there's something to be said for you have to keep relevant nationally, and you don't necessarily do that by throwing out you know just overnight after overnight after overnight without a really good horse coming your way or a group that, that draws an interest. And uh, we're, we're close enough to Ben, we're close enough to Chicago, we're, we're close enough to some places where we're starting to fight for those a, a little bit and you know, that's what we aspire to be. If a junior man, someday if I can do this, I'm going to be great. I've been telling that for 15 years. So, it, when you talk about the handle jumping from four million to six, six and a half million on that night, it's not really just about the economics of those extra two million dollars in the handle, right? It's it, what are the other ways that that creates positive? <clears throat> yeah, there, there's a, a lot that goes into it because what we get off, I mean, I, my, our calculator works. You know what actually that comes from four million to six and a half million, and if there's a little bump to the purses, but 
it's not going to carry you through a 120 day meeting for you saying this is how we how we made our meeting. That being said, we also have a lot to consider um, what to do for the community. You know, the Indiana Derby's been we have gotten more popular in Shelbyville and in Indianapolis in years. Can we do that on a Wednesday and make that you know as popular as can be? Definitely not. You know, we're, we're definitely not going to pack the place on a Wednesday like we would on a Saturday night. Um, there's political capital that comes along with having people in your building, and you know these are just normal things that you're going to have to weigh whether. Um, you know, it's worth your time and effort. But, and I, I will say we're in this really strange spot here where we can't get enough people to work anyway. And if we had gone to a Saturday night event and marketed the heck out of it and brought 10,000 people to track, we would have been the most embarrassed people in the world because we, we didn't have enough employees. And I assume that's going to change at some point, and hopefully next year, where we can consider whether all right, the six and a half million headline worth what you can possibly do on a Saturday, which you know might have some other intangibles that aren't just you know the bottom line. Right. I mean, do you even have like political you know uh, yeah, implications of, of people that you can invite on a Saturday night and show them a big crowd, show them what you're doing for the local economy, those sorts of things yeah. that you probably can't do on a Wednesday night, right? That's correct. And. You know, I'm not sure where we get, because like I said, we have not decided next year if it's a Saturday or whatever. If we do it on a Saturday, I'm sure we'll have a great event. Then I just gotta figure out how we, like John said, we don't end up sitting on top of Belmont because our handle's gonna be cut in half. And we don't want that either. So you know, there's, there's a balance here that we're gonna have to really think about before, before next year. Definitely, definitely. Now, ben, you were saying at Church of Adams in Keeneland, the concept of big stakes days is sort of proven that case is sort of closed and, and uh, you, there's not really much uh, discussion or dialogue with the horsemen or pushback on, on the purse account or anything like that? No, <clears throat> no, we're pretty fortunate uh, with, the, with our clientele and we've got such a great group of trainers that based it here in Kentucky at, at the church in Keelan. They never once complained about the stake heavy weekend and, and you know, one stake on, on a Saturday or two in a row, uh, they understand, but just the, the business side of it with the big days where we're at, they're just so much larger and so many people attend. Uh, it, there's just, it just works and they're happy. Uh, we're generating a lot of handle for their purse account. And uh, what it's doing is, you know, our big days, they're, they're, they're strong racing cars and you know our, our horsemen they like good racing also i mean they they like running for the money and sometimes they grumble a little bit when the out-of-towners come in with the big horses but they get it and we'll, you know we're here in the state we're, we're blessed to be in horse country uh it's so close to lexington and all these thoroughbreds um you know that's been our goal for years we you know kentucky with all the horses we think we should be the best racing in the country that's what we that's what we strive for, and I think our horsemen. We've got a great group of horsemen that stay with us year round, and uh, they understand how we get, and that's kind of the direction we go. Great. What about the condition book? I mean, obviously you've got to lead into all these different stakes races, or as much as you can with uh, prep races, allowance races, uh, both at, at both tracks. How, how does that work? How does it affect the way you build the condition book? Well, I'm pretty blessed to, to work at the two tracks that I work at, Keelan Church of Adams as racing secretary. But, and, and as you can tell, the last, I don't know, I think Kentucky racing has been rising in quality for years, but especially the last six, seven, eight years, it's really getting strong. So when I first got the job at Keelan, before I got the racing secretary's job at Churchill, Keelan was considered stronger than Churchill. And over time, they're equaling out now. And when I do the condition books, I start at Keelan in April. I just go through Derby, go through Steve Foster, and then start over at Churchill in September. It's like one big continuous book. And I think I think that helps uh, just just positioning the races to where the winners of these races have a place. They might win at Keelan, but I know exactly where the winners are going to race at Churchill. And it's just a flow type of thing. And, I think it works well. I think the horsemen appreciate it.
appreciate uh, you know me being both, and, and it, I look at it as one big meet or two tracks if that makes sense. Yeah, and that, it, it's unique that your race secretary carries are two tracks that could be competing for horses, but it seems to work better that way than just plan it out all at once. Yeah, it just does. It simply does. Okay, and then John, you know, you're talking about you're in a much different spot and a smaller track. <laughs> yes. Uh, you've got precious purse, purse funds, how to balance those <laughs> between the stakes uh, and, uh, and the daily. So you said it's about a $12 million purse account, uh, about $1.8 million for stakes, it's about 15%. And then what's, what's the daily overnight in Prairie Meadows? Uh, this year, so we've changed up. This is our first year, just, uh, kind of backtracking a little bit here. It's kind of as a component of you constantly evaluating where you're at and where you sit, right? And the component of the big races. And so these gentlemen, obviously, as they've said, the American seller said, has a little bit of more, you know, he's an hour and a half away, but from where we want to know it, they have huge population of horses. I mean, the things are going to get, right? Well, I'm located in the middle of the state, but it's the corn, I just want to mention corn producing, number one corn producing, and it get eviscerated if I didn't mention that one, I'll see what they're about. Nonetheless, they, uh, I, it's really, we don't get horses to ship in really often. It's very difficult. We used to have a few shipments from uh, Minnesota up in Canada, and sometimes on occasion from Arlington. But those are the, both of those are minimum three and a half to, to Minnesota and five from Arlington. So there's not a lot of horse population for us to draw from. And that's why for us, it's really imperative to take care of the individuals that are there. So again, we have kind of reconstructed how our racing season goes. We used to run a 67 day meet. We're actually running an 85 day or 84 day mixed meet scenario now. Thoroughbreds and corn horses running on the same day. And the idea was to try and take care of our local population as much as possible, specifically the Iowa Spread program. Mm -hmm. uh, and knock on wood, at the moment, it, I mean, we've only we've been talking about this for years. We finally implemented it. We were supposed to implement it last year, of course, everybody put the thing out the window. Uh, but this year, it actually, it's come to fruition. And you've already seen the breed numbers of ours. It looks like the national was about a five, six, six percent drop, going from 19,000 to almost 18,000. Full drop. I would actually went up a little bit for our final breeds. So we're happy with that. And that just shows us, at least tells us at the moment, uh, things are trending in the right way. And in addition to that, we just had our Iowa bread sale, which was one of the strongest Iowa bread sales we've ever had in the history. Uh, for our state, the averages were just astronomical. We didn't have extremes of horses going, well, extremes for us, excuse me, I just watched a $750,000 horse today, but for us, you know, our topper might be sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000. This year, I think our sales topper was only for three, forty five. But our bottom was probably close to 10. <clears throat> so we had a lot of horses in this middle round, which was surprising for ourselves. So the whole idea is that we're kind of trying to orchestrate and organize ourselves so we're trying to take care of uh, the local horsemen and the local population because watching these national crop numbers continuous, continually to decline, uh, there's even been some other discussions from other breed organizations to get your, like especially in us individual states, we're becoming really dependent on the local um, bred horses, state bred horses, and we don't have the influx of the horses. I mean, I understand, especially human uh, historically, in, in, in closed years, the number of owners that used to claim out of those racetracks from Churchill or Keene and bring them back to an Indian Grand or a Prairie Meadows or another location such as that. And that's just not happening nearly as much as it used to because those horses can stay there because the horse populations aren't as big. So we rely more and more and more on what we're able to produce locally as much as we are from horses coming in. So when you start doing it from that perspective, you've got to start organizing yourself to take care of those individuals that are producing and supporting that as much as you can. So yeah. I'm kind of getting off track in relation to big day, sorry, but you know, it, it all comes into play as to how does this come, how does this form together? Well, it's interesting. in our best interest to continue doing yeah, and it's interesting. We talked earlier, and I think you said something really interesting. You, you called it, you know, and it was a common term now, but the, the social license to operate uh, gaming and horse racing in the state and, you know, to deliver to the local economy is part of your reason for being, right? Yeah, so, and I mean, these individuals probably have to do this a couple of times. I can keep and tell you, uh, you know, Kate, I can't remember that. I can remember that. I'm going to keep, keep. Uh, but, you know, in Iowa, we have a lobbyist, we have multiple lobbyists. Up there and talk to legislators, but yeah, you have a social license to operate. And the large proponent of that is what is your impact? What's my impact in the state of Iowa? 
What, what, what the heck, why are we doing this experiment? We've been doing it now for 30 plus years. Why do we continue to do it? Well, you gotta show them numbers. And you do that by economic impact studies uh, and by bringing those individuals out to leasing. Just kind of giving them tours and backsides. It's amazing when you get politicians a little backside and say, yes, we can handle for us about 1,400 or 39 salt back here. And they're like, wow, that's a, that's a very large infrastructure. Mm -hmm. They start looking at, I have one politician who's a fireman, and he comes back and looks at it and goes, my God, that's a lot. And it's like, yes, that's a, it's a heavy investment. It's a continuous investment, especially when it comes to force flush, because you continue to have these animals here in training. Uh, we did an economic <coughs> impact study just a few years ago and with about 20 million total purse money, this is included, we have standard breads, corn horses, thoroughbreds, and all the breeds, we have about $20 million of purse money. We figure out economic impact per year, just shot of 200 million. That's a pretty good return on investment in terms of any industry, and that's what we rely on very heavily because it shows the regulators and the uh, politicians, the elected officials, not only local, but at the state level, but hey, we're here, this is what we gotta do. But again, that all comes in play with it. I've got to keep, we've got to keep that strong at that local base and not get too far afield with, you know, uh, too heavy of a stakes for its day that we might subtract or detract too much from what we're trying to accomplish over the Yeah, it's so important that the economic impact can't be, you know, understated. And uh, in fact, Governor Bashir here in Kentucky was just talking about uh, an impact study that uh, the Econ program did about historical horse racing and some of the impact of, of racing in Kentucky. So uh, it's so important uh, for racing, you know, as, especially in the states if there's subsidies, uh, but even if there's not, to show uh, the economic you know, impact of all the jobs and, and everything created in racing. So, um, Eric, what are some of the other considerations of you know big days? Uh, you know, maybe you know you talked about your circuit and you're trying to build your track a little bit further up every year. Is it you know maybe getting trainers um, that in for stakes races that haven't really raced with you much? Uh, maybe get used to the process, of shipping, find out how easy it is, how easy it is if you win, uh, you know that sort of thing. Um, getting uh, again horse players uh, playing your track, or what are some of the other benefits to big days that are probably more secondary? Yeah, that's a, it's secondary, but it's very important for the track at our level who who aspires to something better. John brought up a good point. If you've got four stakes in a day and you call, name one of your biggest trainers, they're likely to send two or three on land your way. Um, if you had stakes four consecutive, you know, every week, I'm not sure you get that same number. Part of it is everybody's got a problem with their own health. And you've got to find a way to, to you know, shipping has become expensive. It's way easier, to, more efficient to ship more than there's one. And so there, you know, there's things like that that we're, we're trying to work on. But then when you get in there, you also got to, you want your stable game to be as friendly as they can be. You want to try to you know, mitigate any issue that they might have. And, and there's small things, but you know, I, I think as a group, we would tell you it's important to horse me. And you know, they might not even tell you, but I, we know that it works. And so as we, as we go on, you know, we want them to have experience in the clubhouse, which is very good. And, Going back to this year on the Indiana Derby, we, we probably could have packed the house and it would have just been a really poor experience for everybody. So, you know, I think you're making decisions by the year as far as, okay, we've accomplished this, we've accomplished that, now here's our next step. And, you know, at some point, um, we have very strong business and not just our, our racing has been very good, but our casino is, is bars. <laughs> you know, it has just been super, and you know, we we're able to sustain a 120 day meet at about $300,000 a day now, and that, that's a big number. And you know, we don't put a, a huge percentage in the stakes, so you know, we're our overnights are you know, somewhere in that 250000 range, and that there's nothing to be ashamed of when you get there, um, you know, especially when you know, up and down, we're trying to figure out where, where it fits into you know, some of the schedules of tracks that we're. Need to have feeders from when you're not running, when, when they're at Ellis or when they're at Kentucky Downs or whatever it might be. So um, there's so many things to consider just to make people feel like they're wanted there and I really want to go there because it's a good place to be. Yeah, definitely. Uh, here's a question for kind of all three of you. Um, 
but I'll throw it to you, Ben, first. Uh, with Arlington closing down, that's going to leave a couple of voids in the six calendar, certainly on Million Day. Um, is there any chance of that that impacts or the outlook to maybe do another day, or maybe that's something more really in? Well, um, those discussions are being had now, and um, to be determined, but yes, we definitely want to protect those state races one way or another, whether they stay in Chicago or potentially some another scenario. But until that plays out all the way, not a lot we cover there, but yeah, you know, it's in the discussion uh, behind closed doors, and we'll try to figure all that out. But it, 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 those are some nice races, and I do know the company want, wants to protect those one way or another. Okay, yeah, very interesting. And Eric, I mean, Indiana Grant isn't spending a lot towards the state schedule. Might that prevent, provide an opportunity to add an additional day? Possibly. I can tell you we're building another 105 stall barn. <laughs> All right. Um, and I, I would assume there'd be some Chicago horses coming our way, and Brett John will probably you know, would be something like that up there. That being said, I want to go very much on record saying I'm, I'm really sorry for what's happened there. We're, we're all fans of Arlington, it's a beautiful place. So um, I don't know, we, we gotta be careful because sometimes what we think is a big purse isn't that big anymore. Mm -hmm. And you know, I saw the Ben's condition book and we really gotta look at that stuff and say, you know, are some gonna come our way for $100,000 or <clears throat> 200? You know, we're starting to get to that point where depending on the time of the year, 200 means nothing. And, so I don't think we've got an answer for you yet on that, other than to say, if there's an opportunity and it makes sense, I, I think we're gonna find it, but we won't you know, force a uh, square bag into a round hole type of thing, just to, just to try to make something unique. Okay. And uh, John, just kind of switching back, you know, again on the small track side, we were talking earlier, and uh, you know, from your perspective, from the horseman in Iowa's perspective, um, do you need a six schedule at all? And, uh, you know, I think you have some interesting ideas on the importance of the stakes races, but maybe not, maybe, you know, like you said, does the court husker need to be 300 pounds and, and so forth? Yeah, I think, you know, even for your long population, you know, I think this, that personal opinion is that you do need to have a stakes program. Uh, I think that's all questionable. Because you're always going to have you're going to have horses that quite simply are not going to run in your allowance races otherwise. And they don't have anywhere else to fit. You don't want to drive them off. And it's for your locals that are going to have this. But again, that's why we have our classic, I have a classic night. Uh, to try to show these shining examples of what the breed can do. But then just in general, we have these other horses that are sitting in our program that might not be able to participate. Uh, you know, just in a regular allowance race. These low group conditions, they don't fit anything else. They need another opportunity, but you don't want to give them to Churchill, you know, you want them to stay at your own local track, if all possible, because they were, you know, we have our horse coach groups there, and trying to bring different uh, uh, trainers in every year, and, and just trying to make, uh, have this uh, work in such a way that this, this 300,000 is not necessarily going to accomplish the same thing as the 100,000 dollars, or is it 200,000, or where exactly is that level to get something accomplished? Uh, for us, uh, touch on something very touchy, which is with the enactment potentially, because I'm not involved in any lawsuits, I can speak about this. Uh, but this is uh, uh, coming along. Uh, that's July 1st of next year, supposedly the beginning of the date and the enactment. Uh, we've been looking, if anybody knows where our festival is, it's usually the first weekend of July. Uh, we're probably going to move it up a little bit so that everybody can continue to run a Lasix or at least one more shot. Uh, we've had a number of horsemen, uh, I can tell you, uh, I had, I'm not going to say which trainers, but I had at least three very large, well-known trainers, specifically tell their stakes, stakes coordinator, I am there because I could continue to run the races, and they brought horses because of that fact, specifically. Mm -hmm. I have some suspicions as to why we got Nick's go, because uh, why else would you run a little kind of $300,000 rate right in the middle of the corner? But he came, he loved it, it was great. But he's able to run the So for us, we're kind of looking at all different angles and trying to figure out exactly how we can make that work best for us. Uh, so, you know, trying to continue back to your question, which is do we even have a stakes program? I think we do. 
doesn't need to be using a bus. Uh, we'll be able to accomplish the same things. I mean, it's it kind of comes back to, you know, for the players, am I going to get the your you know players' attention to come? Are they going to you know, it's, it's interesting to get the feedback from the players and so much as well, too, because it's tough for me as a horseman. I got to admit, I'm kind of a little bit insular in so much as hearing some of the uh, outreach in regards to, oh, you need to have bigger purses, you need to do this, because I've played the place track for a lot. But I don't know if I get a lot of feedback on that. I can try to look at the data that's sitting before you, but a lot of times, you know, you need that kind of direct personal interaction to say, yeah, I'm going to keep playing this race track because you put together a good stakes program. Okay, but are you going to continue to play when the stakes are play? That's the other kind of component of that. Because you want to get some consistency there too. Does so even come back and forth with you, like you said, you have to remember, you know, well, this is how they choose to play. But if you've been playing all season, maybe they can have another shot at potentially picking some of those out. I mean, it would for sure. Yeah, I think it's like, you know, classic marketing. You open a restaurant, you want people to come in and try, have trial and experience your product, and hopefully, it's a good product and they're going to come back and you know so the, the toughest challenge is getting them there the first time so i think when you you, know, you have the festival the handle goes up or like you said there was three million on a monday night for a pick five jackpot you know i'm not sure how you carve up three million in terms of all the incremental horse players um but hopefully you know, even if a small percentage of them come back you, you know, create some long-term effect um that's positive um, one other, Eric, I wanted to ask you one other effect of, of big days. Uh, does this play a role in simulcast negotiations at all? Is it important to have big days as, you know, Indiana or any track of the trucks that you've been at in the past are always, you know, jockeying for a little bit better rate uh, with the different ABWs and entities or that you broadcast your races to? You know, I'd like to say that I think it does. I, you know, that, that business has gotten so refined with some of the conglomerates that are, you know, a lot of us are attached to. We're a part of the Churchill Downs Simulcast Network, and they do all our buying and selling for us. But, you know, I, I, in talking to Patrick, you know, he has made some reference to a respect for our signal, and I think that can only be a good thing, you know, as opposed to you know, something that's kind of thrown into the bunch. So I, I think a big day does a lot of things for you, and probably some name recognition that you may not have if you don't don't try to have one big day that everybody knows about. Do you think the big days are more important now without the, big, without the marketing budgets that tracks used to have? You know, 20 years ago, when, when you know, I got started, a lot of tracks were on television, you know, lots of billboards, lots of, you know, in the newspaper, radio, you name it. And now most tracks, uh, Trimbox included, I, I think has a much, much smaller budget. Do you think that makes the bigger days more important? Yeah, yeah, you know, we're, I, I will say we're some, I am somewhat fortunate because our, our horsemen, you know, over some time have negotiated some very good deals with new owners of what is now Indiana Grand. You know, it went from some different ownership groups to Caesars, and now El Dorado has merged with Caesars, and it seems at every turn there's some sort of agreement with the horsemen on mostly just guaranteeing that it doesn't, we don't forget about racing. And, whether that's in some staffing levels, but there's marketing spend that has also been guaranteed. So we're, we're a little bit more fortunate. We have, now the question that to me also becomes is, is that billboard that you know most of us really like to see on I-65 that makes us feel good, better spent with TVG on a money back special. And I, I pulled that out of thin air. It could be my twin spires for a, whatever you're doing. And I, tend to think that right now, the billboard's not getting you what, the, what that uh, promotion on an ADW is getting you. So we've kind of gone that way. Um, but as, as the world gets more normal, we want to start doing more things and get people out, get them around the races, get them around the horses, and get them doing all the things that made us fans at some point. You know, we're going to have to get back to grassroots marketing. And you know, if there's no budget there, it's pretty tough. Yeah, it seems like, you know, big name horses like Mixco and She Dares the Devil type horses, that it, I don't want to say it's free marketing, it's part of the business, but that it definitely makes an impact. Um, ben, we were, talking, we were talking a little bit about national stakes uh, with Churchill and Caneland. Uh, you know, how much do you look at balancing uh, versus the big stakes uh, days around the country? 
uh, what's going on in New York, and obviously Oakland's adding more and more every year. Um, is, is that a big part of what you do, or is everything fairly well established? No, I mean, we, we're all, all of us, all tracks and races that are, we're, we're doing our very best to work together in spacing races and changing distances as much as we can. Truthfully, could we, I wish we could do more, but some racing, some race tracks or race meets are, you know, they're handcuffed by the calendar and they only have a small opportunity to have their big days. And, and as the full crop is shrinking and the number of trainers is shrinking, it's getting tough for every track to, to really schedule these things uh, perfectly. We do try, but it's challenging. It's definitely a challenge. And uh, John, so we're, and then with Prairie Meadows, I mean, how, I want to ask you about the process. How does the process go where you, you're having more of a dialogue every year about the stakes, the level going into the big races? Uh, is it something that, I think you said, the track works within some sort of, within a lane and kind of shows it to you all for some approval or dialogue or that sort of thing? Yeah, so what we end up, <clears throat> We've got a combination of things that occur. First is uh, everything is uh, the big numbers are legislated, so we you know we know exactly how much first money we have when we work every year. Uh, once we know that number, it's always predicated on previous years. So for 2020, I was working on 2019 numbers, or, or 2021, I was dealing with 2020 numbers, which you can imagine is not good. But we also were able to work on that meet last year, so we carried over some additional cash from this year. So there's things that we do to try to keep things as steady as possible. But we have, so the large numbers are guaranteed, the number, minimum number of race days are guaranteed, the minimum number of silent gas days is guaranteed. Uh, in order to do some gas, we have to get so many uh, live race days. With, uh, it's 65 race days with nine years cars. So some of the big things that you know we're very, we're be very contentious have been kind of taken out of the equation. So then we kind of look back, we get our numbers, and then we start looking at it again looking at or what's the plan for so overall long-term horizon and then we'll negotiate a contract so we're operating currently under the auspicious of five-year contract for Meadows, and those things are kind of all laid out in there to some degree and then we make minor tweaks each year depending on what it is that we think we need to change so usually typically the, the minor tweaks come in regards to the, uh, just kind of the calendar uh, but the vast majority of everything else uh, kind of hammered out and uh, we just wait and see and then we'll reassess uh, at the end of this five year term uh, where we think we stand if this was a successful endeavor trying to go from 67 to 84 and what are the impacts does it need to be does it need to be more does it need to be less does it need to stay the same i mean you have to be open as the key to the thing uh, even with the racetracks and enforcement general everybody needs to keep an open mind uh, anybody who thinks anything is static you cannot you know, appreciate that, you know, between the implementation as it comes in July 1st next year, having less uh, uh, full, small full crops, uh, tracks going to the that you know, the the there's just a lot of change. And you gotta be prepared for that. And uh, that's when we're open to it. I know my horseman association, you know, HVC, we're constantly dealing with those pressures and, and trying to make sure, make sure that we adjust accordingly to something but yeah, I work with Prairie Meadows where it's a, it's a constant, you know, back and forth and discussion on this topic. So I imagine a big part of your role is going back to your horsemen and explaining all of these things, all these changes, and, and why <laughs> they're doing their best and you mostly agree with what they're doing and, and this is why we're doing what we're doing kind of thing. Yes, and I, I, I you know, I, this is a totally personal thing here too. The number of people that have now come out that, you know, I don't know what happened to the word compromise. Compromise for some reason has become a little out of work, and people don't like to compromise anymore. I mean, they won't give an inch. It's, it's, this has got to be it. And they, they, cut, they want to cut off the left leg. I'm like, you try to explain it. And both, I'm not just talking about enforcement, I'm talking about tracks and just being general. It's kind of really, those, those are the things where keep an open mind, be able to compromise, try to move the ball forward. Because it seems like, don't get me wrong, we're always ultimately come a point where it's like, well, this experiment is not worth continuing on anymore. I don't know what that point is. Uh, we're trying to avoid what we call costs, but you also got to know that it doesn't exist. 
So he didn't know these parameters and realize it's going to operate in that in its confines. Try to for try to do the best that you can. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, I think it's a great experience to combine with Urban and the quarter horse uh, meet and then make a mixed meet and go along and meet and see how it goes. Yeah, we've, we've done that in the past, believe it or not. It's so again, it's, 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 we go back and forth. We used to, a long time ago, back in the early 90s, mm -hmm. we had a, what they call premier uh, thoroughbred meet, and then they had a little bit of a break, and then they had a pure mixed meet. And then we switched to straight thoroughbred, straight quarter horse. Oh, excuse me, I'll go back. Thoroughbred, straight, mixed meat, and then standard. And then I think it was only very short at the time because we ran three meat, three different breeds. That was very neat. It caused some problems with the surface. Anyway, we now then we transition to no more standard breads at the race track, at Prairie Meadows to straight thoroughbred, straight quarter horse. And now we're kind of back to this mixed meat scenario. What's really fun, and then again, this is total personal preference. If anybody's ever watched an 870 and you run thoroughbreds against quarter horses, and it's an 870 yard dash, typically the quarter horses pay for it. <coughs> but typically they won't go 880 yards because that's how mile the quarter horses don't go half a mile, so they won't run 870s. So they call around the books. Uh, my dad had a great uh, horse that would run uh, 870s, and he's one of my athletes out in 870s. So I'm very partial to those. But if you ever want to watch a truly interesting race, watch thoroughbreds and quarter horses go 870 yards. Because the quarter horses can shoot out of the gate, hit that turn, be in front by maybe five or 10 lengths. Then all of a sudden, the quarter horse, the thoroughbreds wake up and realize, oh my God, it's the this and start running and catch up. So usually it's it, it, usually pretty good for them. So that's just a little off topic. Yeah, it sounds like a little bit. Your extreme day Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like I got something else to plan for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we talked a lot about our tracks in the Midwest here. Um, let's talk about uh, tracks around the country. Let's start with you, Ben. What um, anything that you particularly admire? Some of the changes that have been made elsewhere around the country in the last few years in terms of stake schedule or, or uh, grouping big events or things like that. Well. That's a good question on the fly here. Um, I'm very familiar with all their, their stake schedules. And nothing really, you know, I guess some of the turf, turf stake races that created New York for three year olds and things like that, between Belmont Park and, and, and Saratoga over the last couple of years, those are very extreme, got a lot of foreign interest. Uh, outside of that, I can't think of anything on the, off the top of my head. Just so focused on building Kentucky racing, so we want, we want Kentucky racing to be right up there as good as anybody. But that's ultimately what we strive for here at Kingdom Churchill. When Kentucky Downs just had you know a couple of huge weekends of, of racing with, with big days, and uh, uh, you know talking about Naira, Naira's been very aggressive, right? They sure. took the Met Mile and put that on Belmont Day, and kind of took Belmont and turned it into almost like a Breeders' Cup type day with all these uh, great ones that turns it into sort of a can't miss day. I think that they've had some success since, again, a double edged sword when you kind of put everything into one day, but they've been very aggressive with it. Um, Eric, anything pop out to you in terms of what some of the other tracks have done and maybe what, what you've done at other tracks that you've been in? Well, I mean, I think Oakland's a great example right now of a track that is making the most of what they've got. You know, they've no turf course, um, run in the winter, which, you know, in this case might be a might be a benefit, but racing's gotten so good and you know they they are having to figure out ways to take that you know to the next level. You know, expand their lead through Derby Day and all that and because they just got too much cash to give away. I'll actually give you one I think Jill did a great job out of Colonial this year. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that they you know she found a good niche, kept the races Monday to Wednesday which kind of fit um, what you know, the Simon Cass crowd was looking for. People love turf racing, so I, I, I think you got obviously Oklahoma way up to top, and you know, Colonial is somewhere where we are. I was thinking, I think they were just a very good, uh, solid opponent for us. So I'm kind of glad they're done, quite frankly. <laughs> some of those horses back in, back in Louisville and in our region, then. Yeah. yeah, I think it's been great. Uh, I'll say as a horse player and, and my friends that are playing it, uh, I think uh, partly because of the pandemic, but some of the movement of, of focusing on 
Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or, or you know, early in the week or at night. Uh, found you know playing a lot more of Canterbury, Emerald Downs, Colonial, Indiana Grand, in tracks that uh, maybe you haven't played as regularly. And I think it's sort of benefited the racing calendar where. You know, I think in the past sometimes there was a mentality as a, as a fan, as a horse player, well, Sunday's over. Uh, you know, Sunday at Santa Anita, Belmar's over. Now I'm done until Wednesday. Um, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, I think getting more tracks, you know, beyond Indiana Grand and Parks and Delaware, uh, to, I think it gets, it creates that behavior of playing seven days a week, which I think benefits everyone. Um, John, uh, other tracks that you look at? I mean, you. Uh, honestly, I was going to. You kind of. Yeah. I was thinking about Nyla, honestly, and, and how they've kind of condensed down. Uh, from a small. And we touched on it a little bit earlier, too. What's interesting is when some of these tracks are sort of moving these state races and a track such as ours, then we're kind of reassessing and evaluating where our state program comes into play. Because then we're also trying to move. We might move the state race a couple of weeks left or right, you know, kind of calendar or up, down, however you want to do it. Uh, try to avoid or try to make ourselves available for that horse potentially as a threat. So we're constantly trying to reassess and foster, whatever the case is. We're, we're trying to say, okay, how does that work? Can we get a horse that might be probably for that to come and participate in our program? But then we can go out and do something else. So it, it's just, for us, it's a constant, we're, we're kind of, you know, sitting back, waiting, watching. You know, we kind of staked out a position with the festival, but the rest of them are, are very much more valuable in terms of where the rest of our state races kind of come and go. Because if, if sometimes if they put too many of those races together, if somebody doesn't necessarily want to send a full string or somebody wants to dodge some horses, they might actually come to the track and participate in the state. So I mean, there's, you know, there's some components there we're just trying to make it all work. Definitely. Um, talking about something topical, Ben, we were talking about uh, the, the turf course is under repair at Churchill Downs and we've got no turf course for the September meet and, the, and also the fall meet. Um, how does that impact as you build into the stakes days like Clark Day and some of the, the, the days that you've got to put, put on these fall runs? Yeah, I was, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting, a little challenging this fall with, without a turf course for the September meet in November. I think we put uh, four uh, great turf races. That's normally run in, in November. We're just putting them on hiatus. We, we considered offering those and maybe just running those stakes this fall in the new curve, curve course, but we were reluctant to do that just in case there's uh, some delays in the turf course or the sun doesn't go down in time or doesn't take quickly enough. We'd rather just be cautious and not card them versus card them and then have to cancel them. And yeah, it's a tremendous project that's going on right now. As soon as the September meets over uh, this month, I think the sod's going down October 3rd. But, you know, we're excited about this new turf course with, you know, Churchill's turf course is only seven furlongs and it's always been a small turf course and not a lot of running lanes. And just the new configuration of the new course, we've lowered the crowns on the turn so we'll actually be able to have a fourth running lane way out on the outside going forward. And, we're, we're, we're looking forward to next spring when we finally get on the new turf course. And it's going to be very nice. That would be great. And the resodding after the September meet? As soon as September meet's over. We were originally scheduled to start laying the sod kind of about halfway through this meet. Um, you know, it was just, it, it's such a big undertaking with these uh, tractor trailers, with these rolls of sod as probably as big as this. I mean, it's just going to be simpler to do it all at once as soon as the race meets so over. So there's no other ways. Right. That would be great. That would be, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be the, our original turf course. I mean, we, we have the designers looking at what was there. And it's the original turf course, the original drainage, the original irrigation. It was all actually, the guys from Europe that looked at it, they couldn't believe the irrigation system from 1984 was, it was still the original. And, it was outdated, but it was still it was still chugging along. But it, it was time for a new turf course, and it's gonna be really nice next year. That's great. Yeah, I look forward to that. And uh, yeah, I definitely experienced that. I mean, the drain working in tracks. I mean, the drainage is so important because it, obviously it's got to drain evenly. And if you have something that's uneven, then it creates problems for everyone. Uh, Sean, we have some questions. Anybody got questions in the in the crowd? If you're online, 
please submit the questions. We've got somebody monitoring them in the room. We'll try to get those answered. Any questions? So around the world on the Super Days, such as Saudi Cup, Dubai World Cup Day, Hong Kong International Races, to attract some of the best runners around the world, they put packages together to bring the horse, all their connections, expenses paid, to, to participate. They see that need to have a Super Day. We're seeing a little bit in the United States that there are incentives for certain races to come, whether it's shipping, we pay for your shipping, we may bring horses to international. What are your thoughts on that? If there's a competition for horses. Does that work? Is it worth it? Well, I can tell you from at least from current kind of standpoint, they, you know, they, they definitely don't organize a lot of that, and they do pay a little bit, but it's not a significant amount. And especially for us, you know, we're not, we're not, I'm not going to pull in somebody that's going to participate in Saudi Cup per se. But, so our guys are, again, they look at, they try to help facilitate for some of that to a degree, but it's not as important for us just because of what we have to offer. I can see it being more likely for bed or any or any other brand. It just depends on the location, what type of horses you're trying to try. Because we're, 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 I mean, our grouping is great three horses. We're not great ones. We have two great threes and we have some black type and listed stakes. So for us, it's, it's really hard to have that. At least, I mean, Cray Meadows could do it, but for us, it, I can see it being a hard, hard sell to put that kind of cash out in there for, you know, just kind of good races, but not necessarily. I can say the two tracks where I work, uh, there's nothing in place there currently. It's been discussed in the past. Um, we're pretty lucky with, you know, Keelan Churchill, just the history and the prestige and got high purses. We're hoping that's enough. Uh, but yes, it's been discussed, uh, those sort of incentives, but at, at this time, we're not doing any of that. Because even at the highest level is one thing, but we're seeing those incentives coming from Del Mar. If you ship to Del Mar, they pay for your shipping, which again, it's a little different, but sure. with the horse population declining, uh, are we going to see more of that? Probably, probably. It is so competitive for, you know, with the, you know, like I mentioned earlier, the full crops just keep shrinking, the number of trainers are shrinking. So all these tracks, we're, we're kind of going after the same groups of horses. Um, so that topic, topic will be, keep coming up for sure. We did actually kind of, uh, kind of back in uh, terms of horses coming. We tried a incentive program at one point here two years ago, must have been 2019. And it was, you know, same difference if you, you know, I can't remember exact parameters of it. But effectively, you know, if the races hit so many X amount of starters and you showed up and ran, you were getting a bonus. And we unfortunately did not see, it just didn't justify the cost that we put out there. It's not a huge amount, but we spent about an extra 150,000 out of first money just to see during the first, I think, three weeks if we could incentivize people to come. Uh, that was on top of that. And frankly, we just we did not see the numbers with that for ourselves. But again, you know, waters are really difficult because we're not, people don't ship in. It's kind of like we get our local horsemen to come in and we're really shipping them from Oklahoma and uh, some from down south and from Mexico and a few other locations like that. And once they get there, they're there. So it's hard for us to get shipments to come in the first place. But I can see other locations that still be a benefit, especially Del Mar. We've seen that a lot of success with it. Another thing, Michelle, to consider when you when you when we discuss this also, once you start doing that, and then you try to pull back or something, or so and so in New York says we pay for his way to come, then it kind of never ends. And then we're not coming unless you can. We never like to be in the position. I, I like it to be in it as fair as possible. And, Everybody's coming to run for the sport of it in the first line, but definitely a good topic to keep discussing. Kind of along that same lines, you and these gentlemen probably have experiences. If you tell a horseman that there's a 10% horse increase, everybody's like, oh, that's great. That's good. It's nice. I like that. If you say there's a 5% increase, the sky is falling and you're the worst individual that ever uh, you didn't see this coming. So let's see. Back to the point, which is once you start kind of giving it out, it's really tough. You're trying to watch that first to make sure everything's. Nice gradual increase if you can accomplish it without having anything. So. We have another question back here in the room. What is your most important aspect of your job? Very good. Yeah, I, I guess I would say, you know, my kids are 
of the age where they're out of the house, you know, for the most part now. But having my children around and you know the my family around the racetrack and doing fun things. When when I they were young, you know, I was at Canterbury. We did a lot of fun things there, um, from exotic animals to you know very strange things, and the, and the kids loved it. And you know, I guess I I think you're looking at four people here who are very passionate about racing and the future. That's that's pretty cool when when they're around and uh, at the tracks. Uh, that's very nice. And on the professional side of it. Um, being a racing secretary, I, I like being able to help people, whether it's a, 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 an assistant trainer going out on their own for the first time, needing stalls, or, or a guy down to his last two or three horses. You know, racing secretaries are able to help a lot of people, and, and we're always trying to get, we're always trying to get big outfits to come race with us, but we're also, we're also looking after, you know, the little guy, or a small horse out there, because, those type of outfits are kind of fading away, it feels like, and that's not good for any of us up here. So I get a lot of I get a lot of satisfaction being able to help, you know, everybody, but especially the, the smaller type outfits. Uh, so HPPA has done a funny thing. It's Horseman's Benevolent and Protective Association. People, vast majority of the time, if you're talking about ISA or contracts and all the other stuff, that's kind of protective. I'm always throwing that in the protective aspect. But benevolence is probably the most important thing we can do. We have, at least in Iowa, we have about 160 people come see us every year for medical, dental, health, all sorts of different issues that we can venture to think of. Uh, we also have a national foundation on part of that uh, group as well. But being able to help people, Kind of back to what Ben was saying, not only you know, with an individual trainer, but actually helping them out when they're having or they're down on the block. We really need that extra little bit of assistance. Kind of something. Cheering up a little bit right now to talk about it because there's just so many people here. You end up kind of in the camera room through life, and uh, you get people that you want to help out. Sometimes they don't come, they need to help themselves. And uh, sometimes it works out, sometimes it does not. But that's the benevolence part. Does it get spoken about enough in terms of abortion? I have one last question. This is kind of a personal question for me. I always wondered this. Um, when we talk about these big days, and I'll pick on Ben a little bit, back in the day, the Bachelor Manor and the debutante had this tradition. And you know, race, racing is so rich in tradition, breeding is so important for tradition. And those two races kind of stood on their own, and now they've been taken into the Stephen Foster card. Do, do, do they lose any of their significance as far as tradition goes, or does it help maybe getting that race listed on the dovetails of such a powerful card? What's the kind of the balance there between the tradition and the business side of it? And I'm sorry to pick on you, Ben, but the same situation occurs at your tracks as well. Does it help Eric maybe bring some of his smaller races up that might eventually get created? So I, I kind of wondered that about the tradition part of it. And that'll be our last question. Well, Sean, I appreciate the question. And, you know, I think all of us up here, we, we all try to be traditionalists as much as possible. I, I love the history of all of our races at, at Churchill Downs. You know, things change, the business has changed, unfortunately, and, and we don't, sometimes we don't like all the changes, but over time, whether it's, uh, whether it's certain, like those races, whether they don't handle hardly any money and they're losing grades, we're always weighing those factors in and, and race placement. Um, I can tell you just this year, attaching the, the, the Debbie Tom Bachelor Matter to the Stephen Foster car, you know, went back and forth on where to put those two races. Uh, you know, Belmont moved their two-year-old stake races a few years back, so now we've pushed ours further away to get away from those so they're not two weeks apart. So it's it's always evolving. It's very fluid. Um, I think, let's see, I think Todd Fletcher was sending a feeling for the, the mayor for the Florida League. He sends a two-year-old with her part of that big day. Would he have sent one two-year-old 
if he wasn't coming for the other races, I, I kind of doubt it. So it does work out in other ways sometimes, but I do appreciate the, the tradition question because some of the changes over, over time, you know, I get where you're coming from and, and it's, a lot of changes are tough. Part. What about you, Ray? Well, our racetrack's been in existence for 18 years, so the you know, tradition is a different story, but I'll, I'll almost finish what Ben said from our perspective and say, we're trying to build that now. And, you know, the, the best way that we can do that is to incorporate what Ben and that level of, you know, the tracks that we aspire to be and draft along with them and, and start to build that. And I, I don't, you know, 50 years from now, when somebody else from Indiana Grand is sitting here, they might look back and say, hey, that guy already had some plan for making the Indiana Derby a grade one someday, and we got there. And um, it won't be because I'm going to run it on the first Saturday in May, but I'm very careful about what we do with it. John, what about Ohio? Those are your car races. Yeah, I mean, we look at it. Our, again, it kind of depends on what the focus is. It's really tough. Honestly, I think, especially for tracks such as ourselves right now, uh, it's not going to really be a question of trying to increase our graded stakes. It's going to be a, a process of trying to move on to them. Ben's it's on the graded stakes for maybe a little With less horses, uh, it's going to get down the charter. How, it, it, continuing to justify, I shouldn't even say this, but you know, continuing to justify the number of grade ones, grade twos, grade threes. I don't know how that works long term when you have as fewer and fewer, fewer horses as you do. Uh, we're just going to keep plugging along, trying to maintain what we have, uh, at least when we're the greatest service of our horses and stakes in that time, because we know that those do have an impact. They definitely have an impact when it comes to the breeding. Uh, but it's, you know, the greatest stakes when they have, we're not be surprised to so that, you know, which horses and which stakes really is a continuous justification of these number of horses. Where it sticks out, where it sticks in the long term. Thanks, John. And thank you all for being here and joining us for the discussion. I told you when we started this, I didn't think we'd solve all the problems, and of course, or even have all the answers. But I think it was a great discussion to have, and I appreciate you all taking the time to do it. Let's give them a round of applause. We'll be back doing this again on October 12th when we we'll take a look at how racing can grow in diversity. We've got a great panel plan for you, moderated by Alicia Hughes. Uh, Jason Wilson will be here, Greg Harbett, and Ron Mack from Legacy Equine Academy. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for support for the equine industry program.